Good afternoon. I'm Nicholas Bilas, the president for Healthcare Leaders of New York. And we are honored to be co-hosting this event with two incredibly important New York chapter organizations, the National Organization for Healthcare Executives and the Association of Hispanic Healthcare Executives. We appreciate you and the tremendous value you bring in collaborating, especially given our missions are so much aligned. HMY and these two very important organizations mentioned work to foster an inclusive environment that recognizes the contributions and supports the advancement of all. This priority is most certainly reflected into today's excellent panel and soon to be discussion. Many articles were published by the New York Times and uh, Wall Street Journal, to name a few over the last two, three months that covered a widely noticed trend Countries led by women seem to be particularly successful in fighting the coronavirus. Experts say that this success may offer some valuable lessons about what we can learn uh, to help countries weather not just this crisis, but others in the future. I'm excited about the discussion tonight, as I'm sure the 300 members who registered for tonight's event are as well especially with one of our esteemed past presidents, Paige Dwork, moderating the discussion. Before I hand over to Paige, I'd like to remind everyone to check our respected organization's website for upcoming events. For HLNY, we have many exciting virtual events planned that should be up soon on the website, such as our first ever virtual face-to-face -face credited event, fireside chat, with Lenny Achen and award presentation, among other things. So thank you for joining us tonight. And without further ado, Paige, I will pass to you. And if you can take a moment to introduce yourself before starting the discussion. Sure. Good evening, everyone. And um, first and foremost, on behalf of the faculty for this event, I'd like to say thank you to the Healthcare Leaders of New York and their sponsors for putting on an educational event on a topic that is so important and time sensitive at this moment in time. Um, without the sponsors of um, HLNY, we recognize that you wouldn't be able to, um, to host these type of um, phenomenal events. So thank you very much for having us and thank you to the sponsors who continue to, um, to support the organization. As Nick had mentioned, I'm Paige Dorak. I am the President and Chief Executive Officer of East Orange General Hospital. I am also a past president of the Healthcare Leaders of New York. Um, and before my presidency served uh, several years in different capacities on the board. For the past two years, I have served on the Diversity and Inclusion Committee with honor. And um, it is my honor as a member of that committee to present to you tonight the Healthcare Leaders of New York diversity event, um, really circling around women in leadership, but our tie specifically to uh, the COVID pandemic and how and why diversity is so important in all of our organizations. So with that, I'm going to introduce our topic and then I will move forward with introducing our esteemed faculty. Um, really, just to start us off, I think that everyone, uh, everyone really understands what uh, diversity is, but how it might impact um, us as healthcare organizations. So um, just to, to baseline us in reality, health differences between racial and ethnic groups result from inequalities in living, work, health circumstances, and certainly social conditions. Uh, according to the CDC, longstanding issues such as these have put members of racial and ethnic minority groups at increased risk of getting COVID-19, regardless of their age. Um, as a matter of fact, in correlation to white Caucasians, American Indian, Alaska Native, and African Americans have a rate that's five times higher than their white Caucasian counterparts and Hispanic and Latinos have a rate four times higher. So it's significant. Um, and addressing the needs of these populations is complex and clearly there's no silver bullet or we would all have been there already. Racism, stigma, and systematic inequalities have long plagued our nation. However, those of you who know me know I'm always looking for the rainbow. 
And I don't know if you can still see me because my computer just went out. Bear with me one second. Can you still hear me? Yes, Paige. You can. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, as I was saying, addressing the needs of these populations is, is quite difficult. Um, but those of you who know me always know I'm looking for the rainbow. And I think that as we think about COVID-19 and where we are as a world, I think we need to consider that the events of the last few months, um, specifically the convergence of COVID-19 and the Black Lives Matter movement, have truly heightened and forced to the forefront our nation's awareness of health and social inequities and inequalities. And it's my hope and my belief that we're entering a time where true change can occur true change. Um, I'd like to say I have a dream, a dream that we're starting a revolution. And that revolution will lead to sociocultural evolution. Vladimir Lenin's teaching celebrates that revolutions are festivals of the oppressed who act of creators of new social order. Simply stated, it's time for change. The classic Hegelian model of change is based on the interaction of opposing forces. Philosopher of science Thomas Kuhn argues that people are likely to continue utilizing apparently unworkable paradigm until a better paradigm is commonly accepted. And the Chinese in Daoism philosophy uses a metaphor of water as the ideal change agent. Water, although soft and yielding, will eventually wear away even stone. So I say to you, the time is now. Let us be the water that wears away at the sins of the world that have created the complexities that we struggle so hard to resolve. So let me answer an important question for you all. Why an all women panel? But despite what Nick just said, or in addition to what Nick just mentioned, simply stated, girls rule and boys drool. <laughs> All kidding aside, um, a McKinsey study did pinpoint the essential characteristics of leadership and set out to determine the tendencies of men and women under normal, normal circumstances, as well as in times of crisis. And in short, the findings of that study were that women possess the qualities of transformational leaders, which are vision, inspiration, being direction setting, and out of the box thinking. So how does all that relate to COVID-19? Um, as Nick had mentioned, data from cities, states, and countries shows that those prevailing are disproportionately those with women leaders. In some ways, this moment in history offers a fascinating and real-time opportunity to understand the consequences of leadership, de leadership decisions in high-stakes situation. The communities for which healthcare organizations operate are rapidly diversifying. Not only do they provide care for a diverse community of patients and families, but our workforce is also growing more diverse, represented in ways such as nationality, race, religion, socioeconomic status, language, age, sexual orientation, and physical ability. Diverse communities will demand diverse solutions. It's incumbent on healthcare organizations and their leaders to both understand and embrace the needs of diverse populations. Their ability to respond to the needs and preferences of a broader customer base will be critical to their financial and operational survival. With that, allow me to introduce our esteemed faculty who have graciously donated their time to share their wisdom and expertise on this subject and their personal professional experiences through the COVID-19 pandemic. First, I will introduce Ms. Pamela Abner. Um, Pamela has over 14 years of experience working with industry leaders to establish best practices, to set strategic, innovative, and pro programmatic plans for diversity, inclusion, and equity across business lines. As a certified patient experience professional, a certified unconscious bias educator, and inclusion trainer, Ms. Abner strives to develop and guide initiatives to create inclusive and culturally aware environments. Ms. Abner holds the position of Vice President and Chief Administrative Officer for the Office of Diversity and Inclusion at Mount Sinai Health System in New York. Second, I would like to introduce Ms. Kerry Scanlon. Um, 
Kerry oversees the day-to-day -day operations of Glen Cove Hospital. She's been an integral member of the Northwell Health System for more than 25 years, serving in progressive leadership positions, including Associate Executive Director, Patient Care Services, Chief Nursing Officer at North Shore University Hospital, and Associate Executive Director of Quality and Chief Nursing Officer at Long Island Jewish, Jewish Center. Next, I will introduce Dr. Um, Asfa, who is the Director of Female Pelvic Medicine and Reconstructive Surgery, um, as well as the Residency Program Director at Weill Cornell Medicine. Um, Dr. Asfa is a urogynecologist who specializes in the care of women with pelvic floor weakness, resulting in conditions such as pelvic organ prolapse and bladder dysfunction. She has an avid interest in clinical as well as basic science research and has presented her work at numerous national meetings and published in peer review journals. Lastly, but certainly not least, Ms. Tamisha McPherson, who is the Chief External Affairs and Development Officer and Executive Director at URAM. Tamisha has a 20 plus year um, career in healthcare. She has expertise in practice administration, leadership, HIPAA, EHRs, medical billing, compliance, medical coding, revenue cycle management, and truly prides herself as a mentor and coach above all. So welcome to our esteemed panel. Um, with that, I will move into our question and answer portion of the evening. And I think I would like to start with, um, with Pam, if you don't mind, if you could comment. I think it's particularly interesting. Uh, this is a particularly interesting question for you, um, given your role as vice president and uh, CAO in the Office of Diversity and Inclusion to ask you, um, why does diversity matter in healthcare business? Thank you, Paige. Um, and thank you for allowing me to be a part of this panel. Um, you, you know, you pretty much stated it well when you talked about the uh, various uh, components or factors that make up the individuals in our, com in our communities, right? Um, so understanding that diversity, um, being aware of the needs, being able to meet the needs of our, the, the vastly different needs of our society is important. And if we didn't have a focus on diversity, I will say equity and inclusion, um, those needs would go unmet. So simply stated, it's because we have to be paying attention to what's going on. Um, while our society might be based on one particular cultural norm, that's not what exists in our communities. And we have to make sure our culture and the norm is such that we take care of everyone. I agree, and thank you. Because I think, um, uh, looking back in the history of this country, I think there's been a lot of areas where the healthcare industry has failed um, um, people of color, particularly African Americans. Uh, and um, the only way to bridge that trust is when patients actually see themselves in the people that provide care to them. Uh, I think we know that, um, um, you know, this happens in many communities where uh, people seek out uh, who, particularly um, communities who have had some form of injustice. I mean, specifically, I can think of maybe like, you know, Jewish communities uh, who have uh, been through the Holocaust and have had a lot of injustice done to their, uh, um, to their population, uh, definitely seek out you know, uh, people who look like them, who understand them, who come from their background, uh, who can relate to the struggles and the barriers that they have. And I think that's absolutely important in, in healthcare uh, because, like I said earlier, you know, that you can look back in the history of this country with the Tuskegee study or the Pennsylvania, uh, you know, prisoner study. I mean, I can go on and on. There have been many times where the tr you know, patients are putting their trust in, in doctors and nurses in the healthcare system. And that hasn't always always been held in the, you know, to the highest standard, to the standard that it should. Uh, so I think um, having diversity in healthcare essentially ensures that there is, uh, there are, you know, many set of eyes that healthcare equity, that, that um, the, way, the way that we deliver care, the way that we uh, care for every population is actually um, done in a fair way. And I think what better way is there to see uh, people providing care that have also had that same interest. You know, they, they, we could be caring for our own family members in this population. And of course, we're going to make sure that everything is okay. So I think patients need to see, um, you know, the doctors and nurses and the ho you know, hospital workers need to 
mirror the population that they serve. We need to be in equal, um, you know, we need to look, we need to look the same. We need to look like the population we care for. Absolutely. Um, Carrie, let me, let me ask you, considering the most recent pandemic, what has changed within your organization or been identified as a need to change um, in terms of access to care? I think access to care has changed in that, you know, when we've been looking historically at um, traditional models, we've been looking really at the ambulatory networks within our health system. And, you know, that is varied. Um, we have a very large varied health system uh, network. But what's been apparent is the need to really be looking at things a little bit differently. We need to be looking, getting into some of the testing for the vulnerable population. One of the things that we've looked at, um, Governor Cuomo had asked Northwell to get involved and be the tester for um, our patients that weren't able to be. Um, we know many thousands of people were not being tested because they couldn't afford, they couldn't have access to. Uh, so throughout the five boroughs in Nassau and Suffolk yeah. County, uh, there were teams that were done. In fact, that team is down right now in Houston to, uh, uh, teaching how to get those sites up and going. And um, one of the things that we found is that over 70,000 people ended up being tested. And I think that says something so dramatic that people want the health care. It's trying to provide um, really the availability um, to our patient population. Um, in our uh, clinics and services, um, Ralph and I talked a lot about the concept of telehealth. You know, prior to uh, COVID, um, we saw that maybe uh, a number of hundreds of our healthcare providers wanted to use. Uh, telehealth. Uh, thousands of people um, and our providers are utilizing telehealth now and reaching out to our uh, communities. Um, it's a beginning. Um, I think I love your analogy of water. Um, it's almost the beginning of that breaking down, but there's still so much more to do that we need to establish, um, not only thinking in our own health system, but our, our own state, our own country. What are we going to do? And our, our CEO is asking us to look at um, really vul vulnerable in many aspects, but really starting to bring on the concept and the discussion, opening the dialogue of racism. And we're looking at that as a disease. And to us, that means that we have to do something quite different and quite dramatic in the way that we're going to provide care for our patient population. That's phenomenal. And um, what's really interesting to hear is how you've been able to take your experience and really pay it forward down to Texas and I'm sure um, other markets to follow. Um, that's really encouraging. And actually, I would encourage you the same as you're um, looking at racism in the way that you're describing, pay that forward, please share that with us, share that with um, your colleague facilities, because that's, that's just phenomenal. And any learnings that you can find or anything that you can share, I think um, would just be great. Uh, thank you. And we, of course, are always wanting to learn from others, and especially yourself and the SISTEAM panel and the people in HL and all why. Thank you. Um, Tamisha, at um, Harlem United, um, you know, what are you seeing in terms of, in consideration of the pandemic, what needs to change in terms of access to care? So for us, it's been a shift in, you know, the way we do business. Um, we are a homeless provider. We also have a large HIV population. But the biggest shift for us was the clients that come in every day and those homeless clients sometimes not being able to be reached. They don't have a phone. So it's just been a, a transition for our team as well as our clients um, of just keeping them engaged in care. We had a very short period to transition from face-to-face -face visits to telehealth visits. Um, we had a very successful transition with our team of employees that really 
um, were phenomenal through the whole entire pandemic. Um, but I will tell you the challenges of not only keeping clients engaged, but being able to reach them and find them. Mm -hmm. We deployed uh, several staff to do more outreach that were really outreach on the phone by phone versus going into uh, the field. But um, it's, it's so far so good. I, we can't complain. We're really um, happy where we are. I know there's a lot more to be done around um, telehealth and telehealth payments, which is another topic. Um, but I, I do want to say that we have been able to keep our clients engaged um, up, up until this point. That's phenomenal. And I, 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 I applaud you for that because I know just even for um, those clients who we have that are in similar situations, it's very difficult. Even just the notification of test results um, has been a real challenge. So um, I, we applaud you for that. Thank um, you. Okay, with that, um, I would like to introduce to the discussion Ralph Thomas. Ralph is the chair of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee for the Healthcare Leaders of New York. And in his real job, day job, he is the program manager of clinical transformation for Northwell Health. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I want to say thank you for this great panel this evening. I want to thank Paige. Um, Pam, Kerry, Dr. Asshole, Tamisha, for this wonderful presentation this evening. Um, you know, as a Diversity Inclusion uh, Committee Chair, it's been great uh, work that we've been doing all throughout this year, but especially during this time of focusing on COVID plus all the racial disparities that's been going on. It's been great to bring a dynamic panel to speak upon everything that's been happening within the area. I think Paige kicked it off well with uh, talking about the vision and inspiration and being uh, direction setting. Um, you know, those are the great qualities that will lead us into our roles in what we do now and into the future as we grow within our own leadership in our own organizations. Um, but at this moment, you know, uh, Kerry talked about, you know, we have to do something quite different um, in order to create a new healthcare, a uh, new normal. Uh, some of th that does involve telehealth, which is a great tool, but you know, what also will require some education. Um, you know, some of the education will be racial, social, cultural, uh, sensitivity, sensitivity for mostly providers, but also for managers and leaders, uh, applicable for all team members within the organization. Along with that, we'll have the opportunity to really focus in on the data. Um, you know, the importance of data uh, for all patients, but especially for marginalized populations and how it truly impacts disparities. Um, you know, we can use this to go back into the communities and see how we can break down some of systemic racism on the culture and in the environment that places a hold on patients and ask access to healthcare. But along with that is uh, we got to make sure that we're investing and training back into our team members, which is key for them to grow and connect, especially to the organization and clients, as Samisha said. But, um, you know, looking forward and driving the mission forward of all of us as leaders and team managers, we have to use resiliency and compassion when providing care for our staff, um, taking care of our staff, our mental and physical needs uh, to make sure that we get through this time which has passed and hopefully if it were to come again that we'll be prepared this time again for the next one um, you know with equipment but also with the, the mental strength to get through it and know that we will on the direction of great leadership especially from this panel today that we had here um, click the next slide uh, so just want to say thank you to our HLNY board for New York Regional NASI, uh, which is, has a mission for enhancing and promoting black healthcare executives under the direction of Carmary Memnon. Uh, we also have NAHI, which is a National Association for Hispanic Healthcare Executives uh, under the direction of Geraldine for promotion of Hispanic and Latino um, healthcare executives within the area. And of course, the HLNY board for providing the platform and bringing together um, the Diversity and Inclusion Committee to really focus on the needs of this particular area. 
Um, I want to make sure that you can find us on our websites, along with that on our LinkedIn pages. Uh, but a special presentation that we're going to give today is uh, in lieu of providing gift cards to our panels, uh, panelists, uh, we're going to give a $500 donation to Harlem United Women's Health Initiative um, in the name of HLNY, NASI, and NAHI on behalf of the webinar that we provided today. Uh, so with that being said, I want to say thank you everyone for taking the time out of your busy schedule for being a part of this discussion today. We hope that you take some great takeaways and bring it back to your organizations. And if you're in, feel free to get involved in some of our uh, programming that's coming up, feel free to check out our LinkedIn and websites and we can stay connected. Thank you very, very much.